Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's time to take global stories making headlines in our national dailies. And joining us to review the papers is Professor Kamilu Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kanu. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and thank you for having me. All right, so I think I can start by singing Baka de Sala to you. That's one, and happy Father's Day to you. Thank, thank you very much for the compliments and the greetings. Yeah. Thank you. So I hope that you've had a good Salah celebration. How is it over there in Kanu? Yes, despite the economic uh, crunch, uh, we are able to make it. And uh, thank God it, is, it was peaceful yeah. and everything has gone all right. That's fantastic. Good to know. I know a lot of people, you know, were complaining about the prices of food in the market. In fact, rams were going as high as over 500,000 naira. But at least um, people have been able to celebrate in the best possible way that they could. And yeah, happy, you know, salah to all of our Muslim brothers and sisters. All right, let's get into the papers this morning. And we'll be starting with the punch, which also leads with salah celebration. And it says, Tinubu Buhari Sultan can um, prefer solutions to hardship. And the writer here says, President urges citizens to share with one another Buhari Sikh's return to farm. What do you think about this? Um, you know, we know what the, economy, the economic situation is, what the economy is saying. And we hear things like, you know, the, the economy is getting better, it's thriving. Um, you know, the president is still trying to prefer solutions, but it's been for a while. And with this Sala celebration, people have really seen how difficult um, it has been so far to be able to just put food on their table. Do you think the presidents, you know, alongside the former president, the Sultan, the members of, you know, the Christian Association of Nigeria, do you think they're doing their best at the moment? And do you think we'll be able to see some, you know, really good results um, in a few months to come? You see, um, the, the fact is, yes, if you look at uh, it from their own angle, they are doing their best. But mm. if you look at it uh, from the angles of Nigeria, their best is not good enough to take uh, Nigerians out of the uh, problem. Okay, because uh, if you look at uh, the seller messages, um, you see that, yes, uh, like what the president said, there is need for people to share, to sacrifice, you know, to sacrifice and then share with their neighbors and so on. But um, it is one thing that you call uh, for such sacrifices, but uh, the government is doing nothing, okay? Uh, on the contrary, people are seeing that uh, the government and the leaders are not willing to sacrifice. Then he say going to the farm. Yeah, going to the farm will uh, help us. Mm -hmm. I mean, will take us out of this uh, problem. But what is the government doing uh, to make sure that people are going to the farm, uh, to make sure that uh, they can afford farming? Okay, there is problem of insecurity, uh, which chase many farmers uh, from the rural areas. There is also high cost of uh, inputs into the uh, farming. And so this is, these are the areas where the government needs to come, you know. I'm not saying that they, they give uh, 100 million something fertilizer or uh, subsidies. It's not what uh, that will solve the problem. Mm. Well, on the business NG, it says Nigerians experience most expensive Salah celebrations in 30 years. That's what it leads with. Um, Obviously, it's quite unfortunate that, you know, we're here and we're experiencing things like this. I know even during the Christmas celebration, people were complaining, but we never thought that we will get here to this point in six, like six months later. And that's even worse. But let's talk about, you know, uh, um, you know, a report on the New York Times and on the Guardian, it says presidency faults New York Times report blames dead economy for hardship. Do you think that the, the government has been doing a lot of blame game right now? So now they say the economy was dead and that's the reason why we're facing hardship. What do you think? 
Yeah, I think that is that is the basic thing that uh, the government is uh, uh, playing the blame game, and secondly, they are playing uh, the denial game. What uh, New York Times said. Actually, it's, it's a reality. And if you look at the response that Nigeria, the spokesperson gave to that, except for the part that he denied and condemned it in the beginning, but all he said, if you root the substance, is an admission of what uh, uh, New York Times said. Mm. So I think uh, as a democratic government, one of the tenets is for the government to be responsive and uh, to be responsible for its own action. And how can you do that unless the government listens to constructive criticisms and adjust accordingly by denying uh, the fact that this is what is happening? I don't think we are taking the right step to solve the problem. So uh, what I'm saying is uh, basically if you have issues like that as a democratic government what you need to do is to sit down look at the reality why what are they saying is this true if it is true what is the way out but if you deny it and after all you come out and uh, to, uh, uh, substantiate what they said i think you are making a pull of yourself so i think it is a wrong thing uh, that uh, the spokesperson come out so heavily uh, on the criticism, but the, at the end of it, he ended up admitting virtually everything the uh, paper said. Mm. All right, staying on the punch, um, one of the headlines here says food inflation soars by 61% in one year. That is quite alarming. 61% um, is such a huge number. But what do you think the federal government needs to do to be able to ensure that we have some level of food security? I know that one of the measures they've actually put in place was to suspend um, sta um, duty tariffs, right, for um, imp import duties for things coming in, especially things to do with food and drugs. But that's a suspension for about six months. I don't know if that's going to do a major thing for us, if that's going to be some cushioning per se, because I'm wondering what's going to happen after the six months. And when we're seeing such a huge number like this, where food inflation is soaring by 61%, what do you think we need to do? How can we ensure that we retrace our steps back to a Nigeria where we had that level of food security? You see, um, the fact is what uh, the government is doing for, uh, by providing this for six months is just a cosmetic uh, a, a solution or change. And in fact, it is dangerous because what will happen, like you said, after uh, six months? Mm. The fact is that the government, we said, is in denial. They know the basic problem uh, are the things that uh, they roll out. Uh, this issue of subsidy removal, this issue of plot, uh, plotting the Naira, and, and so on. Uh, this issue of taxation. These are the things that uh, uh, plunge us into a situation that where we are now. So unless the government retrace its own step backwards and look at that. Secondly, if you look at this uh, food inflation, most of it is speculative. People gang up. You know, uh, they gang up, they corner the scene, and they, 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 they are just they being too powerful that the government cannot uh, address. So I let the government also address this and close that uh, uh, loophole. We are not going to see uh, the solution as easy as we think it will come. Mm. Well, I, I, I hope that, you know, they're actually doing something in regards to, I mean, the former president now is saying he's returning to the farm. So I hope that they are actually helping farmers because well, let's talk about insecurity. Insecurity is one of the major issues that we're facing. And in fact, when I went to the market over the weekend, I had to speak with someone and she was trying to explain to me how the farmers can't really bring so much goods into the market. And we have, you know, other people from neighboring countries such as um, Cameroon, Benin Republic, um, Togo to Niger that are coming here to actually buy the goods so it's more like if you're not going to buy it we know that other people are going to buy it what do you think the government can do 
to ensure that we are, um, you know, having that level of security for farmers. So we have more in store because, as you know, security takes a huge chunk of our budget. Do you think they're doing enough? And if they are not, um, according to your, in, in your own opinion, what can they do better? Maybe they don't know. What advice would you give them? No, you see, uh, the, the, the thing is, is that um, the government is spending a lot on, on security, but it has become, you know, an avenue of corruption. Mm. Okay, so unless they plug out the issue of corruption there, and unless they have the political will to punish whoever is guilty, found guilty in terms of that. Otherwise, there will be pumping men and, uh, you know, people are making, uh, it is a cash cow for them. So that is why they will not allow the problem to solve. I mean, to be resolved. So unless the government takes these combined measures, wherever you see, uh, you know, government policies uh, effective and uh, they give, uh, give results, they are backed by the force of law. So uh, unless we have that thing, I think uh, the government uh, will be just pumping a lot of money. It's a trend. Uh, it will be a trend on national resources because people are benefiting from that. Mm. So check corruption in that area, you know, take uh, punitive measures on those who are found guilty. Otherwise, you see, we have seen this several times. So many people are found guilty in the area, but nothing is done. So unless you take these measures, and I think the government is very aware of that, is fully aware of that. So that is what they should do in order to arrest the problem. And uh, certainly, you know, they should make sure that uh, the security personnel are uh, well equipped, they are well paid, okay, well motivated, well trained. These are the things that uh, what the government do. They, that will not uh, mean additional money on what they are doing. What we need is to plug in uh, to address corruption in the area and to plug the loopholes and also uh, punish those who are found capable. Hmm. All right. So one thing about food and we're you know discussing how this salad break has been especially for um people who have to put food on their table is not having enough um you know enough spending power right not not having enough money to be able to do that and we've been on this minimum wage saga for you know a, a few months if i can say that in fact for the past six months is the same thing we've been talking about. And here on the punch, it says minimum wage. Federal government pushes 62,000 Naira pay despite Labour's opposition. What is your take on this? Why do you think they cannot just reach an agreement um, as swiftly as possible? Because they know that people's lives are at stake on this. People are waiting for this. Why do you think there is still that dilly-dallying from the federal government um, to be able to have a to be able to give rather a substantial pay to workers? You see, the reality is that they are insensitive to uh, the conditions of Nigerians. Um, you know, when the president come and say that uh, the labor should suspend its uh, own strike that is going to give uh, something above 60,000, okay? Uh, they want uh, their incompetence that uh, at least the government will come up with it, what they call living wage. Okay, mm. but the reality is that we know even a hundred thousand uh, will not uh, be sufficient enough for a person with a, a family of two to comfortably live for a month. Okay, but because the leadership are insensitive to that uh, situation, they also forget the issue of credibility. Okay, by the time you give this thing, you can push it down the throat of the labor and use all the machinery to force the labor to join. But what will happen is that you are now putting your own credibility at stake because in future people will not trust uh, uh, the leaders. And one of the fundamental things of governance is trust, where you have trust gap, a deficit between the leaders and the, the lead. So you know that is not going to go well for the system. So I think what the government ought to do is to look at uh, these things. Like I said some other times when we had this problem, 
to me, I don't think uh, minimum wage is uh, the solution. By the time you raise it, you know, well, I, I told you inflation in Nigeria is artificial. Some people will raise it. I think what the government ought to do is to pay the issue of inflation, to pay the issue of uh, economic crisis, and see how they bring it down in such a way that even if you make the minimum wage 10,000 naira, people can uh, comfortably, you know, uh, live on that one. And thirdly, we have to take into consideration that, uh, which is most important, the fact that the whole labor sector is not up to 10% of uh, Nigerians. And about 90% of Nigerians, with the 10% that you are paying too much attention on, uh, or so much attention on, we are going to the same market. Like uh, what you said about, I think, is punch that uh, this has been the the most uh, the hardest uh, satellite in 30 years for over 30 years i've been making these things but i knew i've never experienced it in such a way like this one single ram even here in kano there around that cost uh, over a million naira so why, why how can a person afford all this thing? Talk of food, now a major of PNC here in Kano is selling about 6,000 Naira here in Kano. So what, what do you mean? And if you take um, like tomato, uh, like uh, pepper here in Kano, also a major is about 6,000 Naira. So with this, how realistic is it for a government to think that they are going to give 60,000 people food to live? So that is why I agree with one of the clergy person in one of the news, he's saying that uh, literally don't make Nigeria a slave, don't make Nigeria slaves in their own country. Well, on The Guardian, um, you know, staying on the minimum wage debate, it says market realities, and I'm just writing off what you've said, um, based on the cost of goods right now. On The Guardian, it says market realities peg ideal minimum wage, uh, minimum pay for Nigerian workers at 104 thousand naira 400 naira um well there are lots of numbers here it says rice price adjusted minimum wage is 102 thousand yam is 300 thousand um bread 150 naira depreciation 125 fuel price and so all of those numbers do you think um that the 104 thousand 400 naira is a good number or um, we have to just go with what the um, federal government is saying. And it says Tinubu's team considering 69,000. I don't know why they keep moving up with very little figures, but okay. Um, so Tinubu's team considering 69,000 as negotiation nears closure. And governors push for an average of 52,000 naira. In your opinion, do you think 69,000 naira, 52,000 naira, or 104,000 naira should be the minimum wage, especially if we're talking about the cost of goods um, and food in Nigeria at the moment? Uh, to me, like I said earlier on, if the government is willing to address uh, this issue of economic crisis, whatever the minimum they put, it will be okay. But uh, since the government is not willing, uh, to do that, I think 104 will have been the, uh, not that it is the best, but it will be an ideal thing. But uh, the fact that uh, the governors are saying 62, uh, some people are speculating 69, all these things will not solve the problem. Mm. To me, in fact, even 104 will not solve it, but it is better than the rest. Because, like I said, that 90% of Nigerians are not in uh, the market, labor market, I mean, labor sector. And besides that, uh, our inflation is artificial. So if you raise it, even if it is 62,000 uh, that they make it, unless we address this issue, uh, the market people will gang up and raise up their, uh, their, their, the cost of things and the uh, inflation will be higher. So I think what the government ought to do is uh, to accept that, to now push for that one or four, but uh, it should also come up with measures mm. to make sure that uh, that one or four uh, is not just a window dressing, that uh, it really uh, addresses uh, Nigeria's problem. 
I totally agree with you because, I mean, the minimum wage talk is just one thing and it's just to cushion the effect of what we're facing right now. But um, regardless of saying and this is going to be the amount, the, the federal government needs to start to look for measures and policies in place that would be long term. Because even this minimum wage, it might not be enough. So it might just be a short term thing for Nigerians to say, OK, yes, we're really sacrificing. We're really tightening our belts, like the president has said. But what is to come? What's going to happen? Because if we're seeing inflation soar to 61 percent in one year, that's to, that would just ask the question that what's going to happen in the next year. So even the 104,000 naira, if they decide to do that, or 62,000 or 69,000 naira would still not be enough. So it is time for the federal government to you know, put on their thinking caps to say, what can we do for these people? And something that is right, something that is substantial um, enough to grow our economy. So let's talk about security. And this was one of our top trending stories this morning. It says, gunmen kill six, abduct many in Sokoto community. Um, this is the northern um, region. And we're seeing things like this. I remember that during the Christmas festivities, I think it was New Year's Eve, people were being killed and abducted from their villages. And now, um, just during, during the you know, celebration as well, at 1.30 a.m., people are being abducted and killed in their villages. What do you think the government or the security forces need to do better to be able to stop these terrorists? You see, the, the insecurity is, is, is a business now. People are making... Mm money out of it so that is why uh, you know it is uh, so rampant like uh, the way it is uh, going on now both the people i mean the, the the criminals and the security agents are making money out of it so that is why it is why uh, it is now so i think what the government needs to do is first of all uh, there is need for proactive measures preventive measures you know by the time uh, you know, events take place, already insecurity has occurred. But if you are able to nip it in the bud before it takes place, that is why you have uh, security. Uh, so what they do need to do is to strengthen this area of uh, uh, information gathering, uh, and not only to gather the information, but to take uh, preactive, I mean preventive act, uh, action uh, to that effect. And how do they do it? is one, let the security agencies build a trust with the communities. Because now people are afraid. By the time you give information uh, to the security agents, tomorrow uh, they will come and abduct you, or they will even kill the person. So there has to be that uh, uh, trust uh, so that people will have to do it. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, the government also needs to look at uh, at work hand in hand and to strengthen the uh, traditional institutions because the traditional leaders are the ones that are very close to the people. Literally, they are the grassroots uh, grassroot, uh, leaders. So we now deal away with them and we think we can go away with that. So they have to do that. And thirdly, I, as I say, they have to motivate the security agents. Okay, many of them, many of them that uh, are compromising the issue is because there is poor pay, there is this. Thing. So the, 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 the agents, I mean the bandits will pay more or tend to pay more to the security agents than, uh, than uh, what the government is doing. So that is why they compromise. So there has to be holistic approach to uh, the problem if the government wants to take uh, uh, to have, uh, you know, the results in, in terms of its own security measures. Mm. So, I mean, one of the questions that I posed was, how does this make Nigeria look? Because if we need to have good PR, you know, all, everywhere, all over the world, then security is something that we really, really need to combat. Um, or rather, insecurity is something that we really need to combat. For instance, the president um, has been moving around, going to different places, looking for foreign investors. 
if we're saying that we want people to come and invest in Nigeria, do we have that level of security for them? If we're saying that we want businesses to be here to ensure that um, we have a good manufacturing industry, is this environment okay for them? So what do you think, how does this make us look, you know, on the outer, on the outer skirts of the world? How do we think that well, we want to get people to come in if we do not combat it? I'm just want, I just want to get your take on that. You see, it put us in a shame uh, because if you look at uh, the bandits and the, whatever you call them, the Arab tag army, and uh, when it started with Boko Haram and other places, yeah. we are now in the, about 12 years, a, a rag ta tag army holding a national army, national security agencies for over 10 years. You know, that is a shame in the, in the eyes of the world. Secondly, it is something that will scare, uh, scare you know, scare uh, the, the, those who are trying to invite to come. So this is a, a double-edged sword. Uh, in the eyes of the world, this is where the way it portrays us. On the other hand, it will, scare, it will scare people from coming to invest in Nigeria. Mm. All right. Um, so I, I know that one thing that I've, I've always said was, you know, the fact that if we do not have good security, then we cannot thrive as a nation. If we want foreign investors to come in, we need to have good security. That's one. But if we're also looking for, um, you know, tourism, to be able to promote tourism, because that's also a good way to get revenue, especially in other countries. If you look at Dubai right now, a lot of people go there and you're spending money there. So of course, there's more revenue for that nation. So if we're trying to promote tourism, then we need to really look at security. Um, well, the World Cup is coming up in 2026. When was the last time we actually held a tournament here in Nigeria? We cannot do that because there is insecurity. Um, education as well. Having kids come here to study. I remember that um, in times past, people from all over Africa would come to Nigeria to study because we had like the best universities. But we cannot have that right now because of insecurity. So I totally agree with you. If the government is not trying their best to be able to give us the security that we need, then we cannot thrive as a nation. All right, let's move over to another story, and I'll be moving over to the business NG. The business NG here says um, cost of servicing Nigeria's debt, foreign debt, hits $2.19 billion yearly. This is our debt right now. This is how much we have to serve. Why do we keep borrowing, and what are the results? Are we seeing anything from this amount that the federal government keeps borrowing year in year out now it is to the tune of 2.19 billion dollars yearly your comments please you see this is foreign debt if you put it with the domestic debt it is going to be higher than that because mm. we are talking only of our foreign debt and uh, the reason is i said it earlier on that we are in a state of denial Okay, we think uh, everything that is happening, we can just wish it uh, to go without taking any concrete measures. By the time we are borrowing, we are borrowing, we are going deep, deeper and deeper into the debt uh, track. And this is what is happening. You cannot borrow and then service uh, uh, the debt and you expect to pay. You see, why borrowing is positive is where the government or people borrow and invest. But uh, where you have uh, people borrowing or the government borrowing and they uh, paying debt services and then there is too much corruption, while most of it will go, some people will suck on it away. And then thirdly, there will be wastages. People, you know, the government will invest in unproductive areas, in productive areas, like uh, just last week, I think we saw how the government went and commissioned uh, Vice President House, it, despite the fact that there is house and this, and now there is even rumors that uh, the assembly and people are considering buying new jets, I mean, a new police for the president and vice president. So these are areas where we are deceiving ourselves. We can be borrowing and look at uh, what is the percentage of uh, the budget uh, that goes to the capital, I mean, uh, uh, current. 
It's about 70%. We only have uh, less than 30% on, on uh, capital project. And about 90% uh, of that uh, 75% goes to uh, the political uh, class. So I think no matter what, unless we take the positive measures to break this debt cycle, we'll be going deeper and deeper into it by saying you pay such amount on foreign debt compare, I mean, add to the domestic debt. And you see that uh, we are where we are uh, to the extent that I think some uh, two months or three months ago, they said um, that for every one Naira that Nigeria gets uh, as uh, IGR, we have to pay one, uh, one Naira and 60 Kobo in debt service. So in other words, we are borrowing to pay uh, what, uh, not even to pay the debt, but to pay the debt services. Mm. Well, you are talking about the vicious cycle of uh, debt, but then um, still on the business NG, it says federal government secures $4.95 billion in World Bank loans under Tinubu's administration. So this administration is even taking more debt than we can imagine. And on the other hand, it says inflation rates um, at 33.95 percent, experts warn of further economic deterioration. So on one hand, you know, the federal government is taking more debts, recurring debts, really. And on the other hand, Nigeria, whereby this money is coming into, is still having so much inflation. And experts are warning us that our economy is even going to deteriorate. Do you think that the federal government or the government in general are you know, they don't really understand what's going on. Do you think that they might just um, think debt, getting more money is the way to go, but that then is for a select few. Do you think that we are benefiting from these loans that we keep taking every single time, or it's just for them? Yeah, you see, it will be quite unfortunate if we say the government and the leaders don't know uh, the, the, the dangers of these issues, and they fully know it. In fact, uh, the, the same why they are in is because they are benefiting from it. That's the simple uh, fact, uh, that uh, they are benefiting from it, so that, that is why they don't want it to go. Uh, I, I don't think it is because they don't know. They really know it, but they are not willing to face it squarely because they know uh, it is... Uh, they who are benefiting. And the second dimension, which is most dangerous, is because the foreign powers actually mm. are pushing it down on us. I mean, by not countries, but we are talking of uh, IMF and World Bank. They are pushing down this throat, uh, down our own throat. And they, our leaders feel like uh, they have to abide by that. So it's a combination of domestic and external interests. So that is why we keep on borrowing despite the fact that we know that uh, borrowing is putting us in a cycle of our debt okay so you know you said the world bank and you know imf they're pushing this down uh throats can't we say no at what point do we really become independent because if i remember nigeria is supposed to be an independent country so at one point, at what point do we get independence where we can say this is what we want to do? These are our own fiscal policies. These are our own laws. Why do we always have to listen to what the World Bank has to say and, you know, IMF as well? Why can't we do what we want to do? You know, looking at our own climb, looking at what works for us as a, as a nation, not a general um, thing that the World Bank and IMF is putting down our throats, like you said. At what point? You see it. It is a, it's at the point when we damn the consequence and we think we, we stamp our feet and do it. There are countries who did that one and they are able to survive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they know. They know that uh, <clears throat> there is no country, no developing countries. This is one thing. No any single developing country that uh, goes the IMF way and uh, get out of it. Because most of them what they do is when they find out there is this problem they retract and they I get it so that is why i told you right from the beginning the fact is that because we are in denial what all the measures we are talking are imf are conditionalities mm -hmm. and we keep on saying eventually they will yield a positive result but we know 
uh, from 1985 to date, when we started Borong with uh, SAP, up to now, there was no single year when we are out of the problem. Uh, in fact, it was the time of Obasanjo when he knelt down before them and they, they forgave us uh, the debt. Uh, you know, uh, after all, we paid over uh, three times or ten times it, and yet they wouldn't touch the capital. We are all on, uh, you know, the interest and other services. So I think unless we now stand, and unless our leaders know that uh, they are Nigerian leaders, and their interest should be Nigeria and Nigerians, not the foreign powers, but the way we are going it okay, uh, about it uh, will not solve our own problem. And, you know, they, they, we are also being, we have, you know, domestic people who are now telling us that, look, the best way is to go and attract uh, foreign investment and do this. Why can't we look at what we have? Yeah. Look at other countries. They just look inside, inwards, and see how they do it with the little they have. But, uh, you know, we are not going that direction. For example, I'm not supporting uh, people like countries like uh, Burkina Faso, like uh, Mali, and uh, like Niger for being uh, a military thing. We are talking the best thing is a democratic system. But look at when they shut off their own things and looking what how they are improved. Look at um, uh, uh, Paul Kagame and his own country. Despite all the prejudice, at least the people are better. Look at when Gaddafi was doing what he was doing. Uh, despite the fact that it was tyrannical, people, I mean, the, the Libyans were much happier. And now that uh, the Libyans, after they kill him, they are poorer and they, are, they have in, uh, they are living more problem than this. In fact, it is now a pale state. So unless we look at these things, yeah, we, we now try to discern and say, look, that is what our own independence is all about. It is about Nigerians and Nigerians, not about uh, foreigners coming to say, do this, do this, give us uh, all these conditions. Exactly. Exactly. I hope that one day we'll truly be free and independent um, and we don't have to listen to what the World Bank... I mean, we can listen to them and take whatever is good you know, for our nation, but we don't have to, we don't have to be conditioned to follow every single policy um, that they give. Um, finally, let's move over to Nature News. Now, Nature News leads with African Development Bank will commit $25 billion to climate finance by 2020, and that is by Dr. Adeshina. So I guess that's a good thing. But what I want to take here is federal government deploys additional 350 security machines for mining sites. Now, we've heard about a lot of illegal mining happening here in Nigeria. And... Um, you know, you're hearing of these Chinese people, you're hearing of people from other countries coming to mine our resources, our mineral resources that what is for us, that was given to us by Mother Nature. But um, I'm sure the federal government is taking matters into their own hands now by deploying um, 350 security marshals. What do you think? Do you think we're going to see a significant change here, um, especially when it comes to our mineral resources being mined illegally? Yeah, that would be changed, but I don't think this is going to be significant because the level of that uh, illegal mining is so deep, mm. okay? You go to rural areas, remote areas, they are there. Okay, part of the reason why we have this is corruption. You know, some uh, public officials, you know, get something and they allow the, the Chinese and even local uh, producers, I mean, miners to do. Uh, you go to... Uh, you have so many in the aquarius where they, you know, use our own uh, rocks and this thing for uh, cement and other things, and you have uh, illegal mining all over. Unless the government takes measure, okay, to regulate these things, like, like the way we, we regulate uh, petroleum or, or oil sector, we have to take measures. After all, what we have in terms of minerals are far, far, far uh, higher than uh, the oil that we are paying too much attention on. So the government ought to look at these things, and there has to be a synergy between all tiers of government in order to address it. 
Unless you do that, uh, uh, people will now keep on going. You, you go to rural areas, even here in Kano, you go to rural areas, you see, uh, you know, the Chinese and this is mining, uh, also, which yeah. not even the local government gets anything out of it. And the worst part of it is, you go there, you see Nigerians as slaves. The way they treat Nigerians is literally slavery in that area. So the government has a responsibility uh, to look at this. But by sh sending such a number of people, I think it will just it will be a drop in the bucket. Mm. All right. Um, this is where we have to wrap it up on this segment. Thank you so much for coming, sir. It's always a pleasure reviewing the papers with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. And back at the to you once again. Thank you. And thank you very much again. Yeah. All right, we've been speaking with Professor Camille Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science at Bayero University. And we'll just be taking Global Stories me making headlines in our national dailies. We'll go on a short break and when we return, we'll be looking at our first, at our first hot topic. Well, this one talks about, um, you know, rotation for regions when it comes to single terms with governors and the president. Please stay with us. <laughs> 